He is risen. He is risen indeed. Whether you're here in person or you're joining us online, it is so good to have you with us today. For those of you who may not know me, I'm Dawn Hauser. I'm the pastor here at Aiken United Methodist Church. You know, the journey through Holy Week is a dark and depressing time. There was a lot of work that was being done in the darkness of the tomb, though. A lot of work. Then Easter morning arrived, and here we are. Death had been defeated. Today we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. He is risen. He is risen indeed. I'd like to invite you to please stand as you are able and sing with me from the United Methodist Hymnal number 302, Christ the Lord is Risen Today, and we'll sing verses 1 through 4. Often we see fire outside at a bonfire. Just in different places we see fire. In the ancient church, fire outside symbolizes the resurrection. The central sign of that fire is the Easter candle, signifying the triumph of the resurrection over the darkness of sin and death. Today we are going to light our Easter candle. It's also known as the Pascal candle, and it reminds us of the resurrection. I'd like to invite you to read the words with me that are located in your bulletin and on the screen as we light the Easter candle. And I'm going to invite Bruce to come and to bring the light.
the light of Christ rises in glory, overcoming the darkness of sin and death. Christ is our light. Amen. Please remain standing as you are able, and you will find the words for our acclamation are written in your bulletin. I will again read the italicized words if you would respond with the bolded words. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Please remain standing as you are able as we offer our opening prayer to our Creator. Let's pray. God of life, the women came to the tomb on that first day of the week, hands laden with spices of sadness. So we come this morning, hearts broken by the sin of the world. You met them in resurrection power and sent them running down the path to tell others that the tomb was empty. Meet us this morning in our songs and story, in scripture and sermon. Reveal to us the risen Christ, so that we too may tell the good news that life is stronger than death. In the name of the Christ we pray, amen. Please remain standing as you are able. I promise I'll let you sit down after this. <laughs> but please sing with me from the United Methodist Hymnal number 322, Up From the Grave He Arose. Today's scripture reading is Luke 24, 1 through 10. At the crack of dawn on a Sunday, the women came to the tomb, carrying the burial spices they had prepared. They found the entrance stone rolled back from the tomb, so they walked in. But once inside, they could not find the body of Master Jesus. They were puzzled, wondering what to make of this. Then, out of nowhere, it seemed, two men, light cascading over them, stood there. 
The women were in awestruck and bowed down in worship. The men said, why are you looking for a living one in a cemetery? He is not here, but raised up. Remember how he told you when you're still back in Galilee that he had to be handed over to the sinners, be killed on a cross, and in three days rise up? Then they remembered Jesus' words. They left the tomb and broke the news of all this to the eleven and rest. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, mother of Mary James, and the other women. And they kept telling these to the apostles. But the apostles didn't believe a word of it. They thought they were making it all up. The word of God, the people of God. Thank you, Eileen. Well, about two minutes before the service started, I said to Danny, I think that today I'm going to come out from behind the pulpit. And she said, oh, great, right? Now she has to rework her camera stuff. But she's good. She, I'm getting the thumbs up, so we're okay. And the microphone's working. Technology is on our side this Easter Sunday. That is a miracle, let me tell you. <laughs> 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 we didn't have to wait an extra two minutes for everything to reboot up at the beginning of the service. We didn't have to do any of that. It's just working great. Yeah, sh I'm going to jinx us, right? So, you know, I was thinking last night as I went to bed, you know, you don't have a thing to say tomorrow, Dawn. I was drawing a blank. I said, what am I going to say on Easter Sunday morning that hasn't already been said, right? We've heard this story time and time again. But I want to tell you the story again. Because the story is worth hearing again. But I want to go back further than Palm Sunday. Because you see that Christmas and Easter are linked together, right? We can't have Easter without Christmas. So I want to tell you a story about a man. This man was born an infant, right? So early, early in time, thousands of years ago, there was this infant that was born. And we know it was a special day because there was a star that hung in the sky. And that star was so significant that the Magi, for a few years, followed that star. That star rested over the place where this infant was. And when the Magi arrived, they brought gifts gifts that were befitting a king. They were some of the first who declared that this infant was the king, the king of all of humanity. Now, this child that was born was like most children, grew up, gave his parents a heart attack from time to time, probably did things that most normal children did, but there was something a little special about him. As he grew to be a man, well, he was called into ministry. I have to tell you, I'm glad that my calling into ministry was not like that because I'm not so sure that I would have passed those tests. You see, he spent 40 days in the wilderness being tested by the adversary himself. And they were some pretty significant tests. They were tests that we all, experience in life. But this man was not only human, he was divine. He was God incarnate. It was an interesting thing. And soon as he left the wilderness, he started preaching. And his first sermon was in the synagogue, his home synagogue. Do you know that when you are, when you are called into ministry and you, you are sent out and and sent to serve a church, they will not send you to your home church for good reasons, right? <laughs> and so, but not this man, not Yahshua. He went and started in his home church. It wasn't good. They ran him out of town. They tried to run him off a cliff. They wanted no part of that. But he started this ministry. And you know, you're going to be shocked when I tell you this. He was a homeless vagrant who traveled around a lake, who picked up a few friends along the way, and they traveled together around this lake. 
And he was teaching people. He was teaching people how to live in the world that they were living in in that time. Now, you see, the world that they were living in was not good. It wasn't good at all. The people were oppressed by the Roman government. They had been put into slavery. Every horrible bad thing that could possibly happen would happen to these people. And so Yahshua, Jesus, was teaching them how to live. And he was trying to explain to them that there's something beyond this. That this world that you're living in here right now, where you feel like you are got a thumb on you all the time, it doesn't, that's, this is just not all there is. There's so much more. And he continued to teach them. And then pretty soon, after three years, last week, we celebrated Palm Sunday. Yahshua and his band of merry men decided it was time to go into the belly of the beast and enter Jerusalem. And what did they find there in Jerusalem? They didn't find anything good, that's for sure. As they entered into Jerusalem, all of a sudden, what Jesus and the disciples discovered was that the religious leaders, the religious leaders were the ones who were working against him. They didn't like what he had to say. They didn't like the fact that they couldn't control everything that he was doing and saying. He was saying and teaching things that were counter to what they had been trying to tell the people. They were trying to keep the people suppressed and keep them calm. And at the same time that they were doing that, the Roman government was doing anything and everything that they could to keep the people suppressed. It was unbelievable the things that they would do to people. You know, we hear about the crucifixion of Jesus. We don't realize that there were lots of people that were crucified. The street heading into Jerusalem was lined with crosses with people hanging on them. They did that to scare people. They wanted people to be suppressed. And so along comes Jesus, who's teaching these people that they don't have, they're not oppressed. They're not oppressed. They're not going to live into eternity in oppression. They don't have anything to be afraid of. And so the religious leaders are the ones who used the Roman government. They used the Roman government to kill Jesus. It was a collaboration between the religious leaders and the political leaders that murdered Jesus. And then, after he died on that cross, he was laid in that tomb. It was a brand new tomb. Nobody else had ever been laid in that tomb. It was pristine. They laid him there. They rolled the stone in front of it. But do you know what the Roman government did? They planted a couple of guards outside the tomb because they were so afraid that he might walk out of that tomb. They did not want him teaching all of these things he had been teaching. They didn't want him teaching people that life is beyond this. They did not want him doing that. And so they planted these two, two Roman soldiers there, and we know what happened to them. They got drunk, fell asleep, and then the women showed up. Remember? Remember at the crucifixion, the disciples were terrified, absolutely terrified, that what would happen, what happened to Jesus would also happen to them. And so they were holed up in the upper room, locked in. It was the women, the women who left, who went to the tomb to care for Jesus' body. They loved him so much, and they didn't care if they had to deal with these Roman soldiers. And when they got there, the tomb 
was open. The stone had been rolled away. And when they entered the tomb, there was angels there who said, what are you doing here? Who are you looking for? He told you he wasn't going to be here. What are you doing? And we know the story of Mary in the garden and how Jesus came to her. We know that story. But it was right after these women discovered that this tomb was empty and Jesus wasn't there. It wasn't that his soul had, had ascended and he, his body was still there. That wasn't it. it. He just wasn't there. There was nothing there except the grave cloths, except the cloths he had been wrapped in. These women got so excited because they connected the dots. They remembered all the things that Jesus had told them. Jesus had told them that he would live beyond death. And they went running to find the disciples. And we know the rest of the story. All of a sudden, Jesus makes appearances. We read in the book of Acts that after Jesus' death, he made 500 appearances, 500 accountings of him being resurrected. Who's going to discount that, right? 500 people saw him alive after his death. Amazing story. If somebody told us this story today, we'd think they were crazy, right? But what Jesus told the disciples and what Jesus continues to tell us every single day is that in the resurrection, death was defeated. Death is no more. Now, we live in a world right now especially where we, we live with a lot of fear. We're afraid of war, right? Right? I don't think we can get in our car and drive any place with somebody without a conversation about, uh, uh, you know, there's potential for nuclear warheads to start flying, right? We, we're afraid of war. We're afraid of inflation. How are we going to afford to feed our families and pay the mortgage and pay the insurance and the, pay the car payment, and make sure there's shoes for children and all the things that we need to do. How are we going to afford that? And good heavens, don't let me talk about my 401k. I'm going to be afraid of that because how am I going to feed myself when I retire, right? So we're afraid of that. We're afraid of so many things in this world. The ultimate thing as a human being that we are afraid of is death. And Jesus knew that. And in the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus is telling us, I have defeated death. You don't even have to be afraid of that. You don't have to be afraid of anything. Nothing. Stop being afraid. Stop living in fear. Because I've defeated all of that. There is something beyond this world. And so in the resurrection, we find hope. There's hope and there's healing there. I often say, as children of God, we dance in the light of the resurrection. Every single Sunday, not just this Sunday, every Sunday that we show up here on Sunday morning to worship and praise God, it's a mini Easter. We dance in the light of the resurrection because in the light of the resurrection, what we find here is love and peace and joy and warmth and companionship what we don't find here is darkness and fear. Jesus defeated death. Jesus, Jesus has given us so much more than what we could possibly imagine. I want to finish this morning by telling you this. So I woke up. When I went to sleep last night, I said, Oh, Lord, I have no idea what I'm going to say, but you put the words in my head while I'm sleeping, okay? And... So this morning when I woke up, I stumbled upon an article. Some of you may know who Roger Woosley is. He wrote a book called Kissing Fish Book. And Roger Woosley wrote an article in a periodical called Pathos. And it came out yesterday. And at the very end of it, he finishes his article by saying this. And I think they're good words for us to think about as we prepare to move on in our service and to 
prepare to leave. This is what he said. So what about you and me today? Do we still doubt that Jesus' way of love, that his way of the cross and Via Della Rosa, way of suffering, makes much sense in this modern, competitive, get them before they get you, dog-eat-dog world? Do we think that kind of suffering servanthood can make a difference or transform our, while, our world of new empires and huge and powerful systems and institutions? What about today? What about today? What does the empty tomb mean to us today? What kind of power does the empty tomb have? All of the things that oppress and bring darkness can be gone if we just dance in the light of the resurrection. Amen. You know, I want to say thank you to everybody that bought all these flowers because they are gorgeous, aren't they? They are absolutely beautiful. It makes me wonder what the garden was like where Jesus' tomb was. Were all these beautiful flowers there? You have to wonder sometimes, don't you? 
Well, since Jesus is alive and the Holy Spirit is present with us, we offer our prayers, both individually as well as collectively, knowing that our prayers are heard by our Creator. We're going to offer our corporate prayers for the world in just a minute, but first, I'd like to invite you to respond with the words, hear our prayer. When you hear the words, risen Jesus Christ, who has conquered death, let's pray together. God of the living, victor over sin and death, living spirit, give your church victory over doubt that hearing and believing your word, we may be obedient to what you command us to do. We pray for all world leaders that they may do justice and so honor you, as well as serve the people for whom they bear some responsibility. Risen Jesus Christ, who has conquered death, hear our prayer. We pray for all who doubt that they may not be content to live with their questions without actively searching for evidence of your love in Christ and the church. We pray for all who are sick and suffering that the victory of Christ over suffering and death may give them new hope of recovery or eternal life, that they may know that in life and in death, they are yours. We especially pray for those whom we now hold in the silences of our hearts. Risen Jesus Christ, who has conquered death, Hear our prayer. Eternal God, we remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you in the church on earth, who now rest from their labors, especially those most dear to us, whom we have lifted before you today. Keep us in communion with all your saints and bring us at last the joy of your heavenly kingdom. Amen. So now we pray, as our Savior has taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, after the death of Jesus, the disciples were scared and they were holed up in the upper room. Soon Jesus began to make his appearance to them. After many appearances, he prepares the disciples for his ascension. It is just before Jesus ascends that he gives them the great commission to go out into all the world, to make disciples of all the people, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them all the things that Jesus had taught the disciples. We as the church take this commission very seriously. We cannot possibly make disciples and share the good news without you. I'd like to invite you to partner with us. The sharing of your resources of time, talent, and gifts and your financial support allow the church to continue to answer the Great Commission. If you are watching at home online, you will find all the information for our online giving is in the body of the video. If you're here in the sanctuary, you will see some beautifully crafted wooden boxes in the back of the sanctuary, ones over here and ones by the, the main doors. And if you would like to leave your offering in those, someone will care for those after this service. Please stand as you are able and sing with me our Easter doxology. The words are sung to the tune of Christ the Lord is risen today, and you will find the words are written in your bulletin as well as on the screen. Praise to God, his power
Let us pray and ask God to bless the offering we have received. We know, O oh God, that the good news of the resurrection is not to be kept a secret, hidden away as the private promise for a few. Rather, it is to be a universal communication of hope and joy to all people and to and to that worldwide proclamation, we dedicate our gifts today. In the name of the Christ, we pray, amen. Well, our bulletin today is, or our benediction today is spoken responsibly, and you will find the words to the benediction are written in your bulletin as well as on the screen. I'd like to make one note, though. The note is this. You get to start. <laughs> So, this amazing day. May God's name be praised. And may the creative love of God, the power of Jesus' resurrection, and the sustaining grace of the Holy Spirit be with you now and with your loved ones wherever they may be this day and always. In the name, amen. amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Please remain standing as you are able and sing with me from the United Methodist Hymnal number 310, He Lives. to share the light and the love of Jesus Christ with the world. Amen.